This is the first lecture in the series for the second day of the 2014 Trotwood Fire and Rescue Paramedic Refresher. This is the first lecture that's going to be covered for January the 18th of 2014. We're going to cover obstetrics first. Uh, this was a lecture that was put on for Trotwood Fire and Rescue in 2013 by the staff of Grandview Medical Center in Dayton. All right, so pregnancies in general. Just remember these things were uncomplicated. Most of them are uncomplicated. Women have been giving birth for you know, centuries without the help of EMTs and paramedics. So long before paramedics and EMTs were ever you know, thought of, women have been giving birth. So and like I said, most of them have been uncomplicated. However, there are complications that arise. Um, so that eclampsia, preeclampsia, diabetes, whether it be gestational diabetes or if they had diabetes prior to um, being pregnant, Hypotension and hypertension, once again, either prior to or if they, it became some kind of a gestational problem. Cardiac disorders, abortions like spontaneous abortions, trauma as it relates to trauma or while they're pregnant, and any kind of placenta abnormalities. These are the things that we need to be there for. Um, some of the complications that arise and things that we can, you know, basically, you know, we want to make sure we get them to the hospital. So if there is any kind of abnormality, there is any kind of a problem, we can help them. So childbirth in general, it involves both labor and delivery. So labor is obviously the, uh, the act of, you know, contractions and, you know, pushing and, you know, the child actually leaving the birth canal. The delivery itself is, you know, the child being expelled. Once the child is delivered, then we need to, you know, start doing our APGAR scores and, any kind of resuscitation efforts that we may need to do. It is a natural process, and anyone that's ever delivered a child, usually it's fairly basic assistance. Usually you're just helping with shoulders or you know, making sure the head comes out right and you know, making sure that mom breathes right. So anyone that's delivered a child, it's, you know, it's a fairly simple process. Keep in mind that you do have two patients. So if you do have two patients, you want to try to have somebody extra in the back of the ambulance because if it is an imminent delivery once the baby's born one person's got to take care of the baby while the other person's taking care of mom and then any kind of complications that may arise or if mom is critically ill after the baby's born or vice versa it may take both of you to start taking care of the patient some of the things that you know we may encounter would be a breach or a limb presentation so in other words a it be a butt first or the limb presentation with the arm or their leg. Multiple births, it's not uncommon for women to end up having uh, twins and not know it. Triplets and quadruplets, it's a little harder. You know, obviously, unless they thought they're having one baby, and you know, but they're giant, you know, most of the time they would know. But it's not uncommon to say they thought they're having twins and they ended up having triplets. So, umbilical cord problems, whether it be a nuchal cord, so the cord's wrapped around the baby's neck or... You know, the baby is laying on top of the cord, um, putting pressure on the cord. Disproportion, which is, you know, when the female has a smaller cervix, or there's it's a smaller female or they just have a small cervix, and the child has a larger head, and they're going to have a hard time, you know, fitting through the through the cervix. Excessive bleeding after the pregnant, or I'm sorry, after the baby is born. Um, any kind of pulmonary embolus. Women having, you know, they just have a decreased blood flow. While they're pregnant, swelling to the legs, and they can end up throwing pulmonary embolus during this. And then the neonate require, requiring resuscitation, that's a big deal. Um, we all know that you know we don't like taking care of pediatric patients just because it's a little bit harder. Um, they're not small adults, so it requires special equipment, and it's something that we don't typically do. So if we do run into a problem with a neonate requiring resuscitation, sometimes it takes a little bit more effort. It's something we need to practice, and we need to make sure that we're on our A game because this is critical time. And then any preterm labor, I believe it's anything before 28 weeks is a preterm labor. Okay, so this is, so we've got the vagina, the cervix, the uterine cavity. This is where the baby is actually kept. Um, so, and then the fundus, this is when we start talking about the level of the fundus. So, the ovaries. Um, anyways. 
Right, so ovulation, fertilization, implantation. So ovulation is the releasing of the egg. The fertilization is the sperm. Implantation is the fetus actually being implanted into the uh, uterus. All right, so the placenta itself, these are things it provides to the baby and to the mom. It's transfer of gases, transports the nutrients, it excretes the waste, um, so it holds the excretion of the waste, so the poop and the pee from the baby, hormone production, and then it protects the baby. The umbilical cord, it connects the placenta to the fetus, has two arteries and one vein. Remember that we can cannulate the vein if we have to after we've so we can you know, cut the umbilical cord. You can actually uh, cannulate that vein if you have to um, as a last resort for a, a neonate. The amniotic sac, the membrane surrounding the fetus, fluid originates uh, from the feral sources, about 500 to 1,000 uh, milliliters uh, after about 20 weeks contained in the amniotic sac. And when it ruptures, it produces a watery discharge. Now the fetal growth process, um, about the end of the third month, you're going to be able to tell if it's a male or a female. You should be able to see the heart beating, and every structure that found at birth is present. So the fingers, the toes, um, penis, vagina, everything is is there. Into the fifth month is when you start hitting fetal heart tones can be detected, and the fetal movement may be felt by the mother. So the baby just you know moving around, kicking or pushing. Into the sixth month, may be capable to survive if born prematurely. And the middle of the 10th month, it's considered to have reached its full term, and then the expected date of confinement. So. All right, so ectopic pregnancy. This is, you know, anywhere outside of the uterine cavity, and about 95% of ectopic pregnancies are in the fallopian tubes. It occurs in one in every 200 pregnancies, and if you think about that, that is a pretty high number. Um considering you know how many women do we go on each year that are pregnant and one in every 200 are actually ectopic so most are asymptomatic so it's very rare that they'd be asymptomatic ectopic pregnancy it's very painful because the body's just not meant to grow the baby in the fallopian tubes some predisposing factors be tubal infections any kind of previous tubal surgeries if they have an IUD use so if they've got the intrauterine device and any kind of previous ectopic pregnancies, they have a past history of previous ectopic pregnancies. All right, so a history, um, if they've missed a period, uh, other signs of early pregnancy, um, so this may be like lactation, uh, this may just be swelling of the ankles, this may be abdominal pain, um, the spotting, if they have spotting, you know, vaginal bleeding about six to eight weeks after the last period, and then upon rupture, the bleeding may be excessive. So this is something we have to be prepared for. If they don't know that they're pregnant and it becomes a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, we may get called for, you know, vaginal bleeding. Typically, it's a lower abdominal pain. That pain could be sharp or dull, constant or imminent, and, I'm sorry, intermittent. It's diffuse or localized and maybe you're to refer to the shoulder pain. Um, so for us, these are just questions we need to start asking because once again, they may not even know they're pregnant. So we need to start asking when their last menstrual period was, any chance of pregnancy, how many babies they've had, have they ever had an ectopic pregnancy before? These are just questions that we need to start asking them to kind of start ruling things out to help us. So for physical exam, we need to have signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. So for us, you know, that would be tachycardia, Pale skin, hypotension, altered mental status or altered level of consciousness, orthostatic hypotension. Um, yes, we don't do orthostatic vitals anymore, but if the female goes to stand up and she passes out or she gets real lightheaded, that means she's possibly got an orthostatic hypotension. She's got a severe blood loss. They have a tender lower abdomen and they have a powerful mass may be present. So obviously that is a large and in charge powerful mass and I hope if you see something like that you know that uh that's bad and if anybody doesn't recognize her that's the octo mom
All right, so abdominal pain or unexplained hypovolemia, plus it's a woman of childbearing age. It's an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. So abdominal pain or unexplained hypovolemia. She's of childbearing age. It's ectopic until proven otherwise. So things that we need to do for them, high concentration of oxygen. Is there an IV or IVs with LR or normal saline? Uh, if anybody doesn't know right now, this is kind of par for the course, but there's a national shortage of normal saline, lactated ringers, and I believe D5W. So I don't know what we're going to be using, but uh, possibility of us at actually using LR. But right now, you know, it would be IV or IVs. So one or two IVs. If they're hypovolemic, we need to make sure we get two or more IVs in them. Doesn't necessarily mean you need to run them high flow. You just need to make sure that they're wide open. You just make sure you have them. Um, using a mass trousers, that's a possibility. We obviously don't carry mass trousers anymore. Anybody that's been in the EMS service for quite a while knows that those come in and out of our protocol. So if they come back into the protocol, that could be something that we could use. And then, you know, at least and definitely not last, I'm sorry, last but definitely not least, is immediate transport. These people do not need us. They need to get to the hospital because they're going to need a surgeon or somebody to take care of this. They do not need a paramedic. They just need a quick ride to the hospital with lights and sirens. All right, so an abortion. It's def defined as a termination of pregnancy before, the, before fetal viability, so 20th week. Spontaneous abortion, it's about 20 to 25 percent of the pregnancies terminate spontaneously, usually due to embryo abnormalities, and it may also result from infection and favor unfavorable interuterine environment and a cervical incompetence. So, in other words, the body is just you know can't accept the fetus. So, spontaneous abortion, so it's threatened, inevitable, complete, incomplete, and missed. So these are the five different types of spontaneous abortions. So it's threatened. It's vaginal bleeding, mild or absent contractions. They have a closed cervix. It says about 20% of women bleed in early pregnancy and about 50% go on to abort. And any bleeding in early pregnancy is dangerous and abnormal. So keep that in mind. Any bleeding in early pregnancy is dangerous and abnormal. They should not be bleeding in early in their pregnancy. Inevitable, so if they have vaginal bleeding, they're moderately severe contractions, possibly amniotic sac rupture, cervic effacement, dilation, and changes are irreversible. So once that happens, there's no way to turn back. You can't return, or you can't change that. A complicated spontaneous abortion, so the products of conception are expelled, whether it be the fetus, placenta, uh, the sidial lining, so... This is where we usually find women when they're sitting on the toilet um, and they expel the, they'll expel the fetus or the placenta. So signs and symptoms, profuse vaginal bleeding, the passage of the tissue to the clots, continuing mild contractions and possible hypotension. So, you know, when we have the, what we'll call the toilet babies, or the babies that end up, you know, mom sits down, she thinks she has to move her bowels. Next thing you know, she ends up expelling the, the fetus. So this is incomplete. Or, I'm sorry, this is complete. So incomplete, products of conception are retained, um, signs and symptoms, they have profuse bleeding, passage of the tissue clots, severe contractions, hypotension and shock, and they're septic. And this is because the basically the products have not been expelled and they get very, very septic, they get very sick from this, they get infected. So a missed abortion, the fetus dies in utero before the 20th week and is retained at least two months afterwards. So that is a that's a bad thing. So basically, the baby is in there. Mom doesn't feel it kicking. Um, doesn't realize that it has died, and it's basically aborted. So it says continued amenorrhea. Um, so that's just amniotic fluid. You know, they've it just continuously, you know, basically they a uh, their vagina is constantly just got a amniotic fluid that's flowing out of it. History of the bleeding without cramping. Decrease in the uterine size, the reabsorption of the fluid, and the calcification of the products of conception. All right, so it's a confirmed or suspected pregnancy. Um, 
abdominal pain, cramping, bleeding and patches of tissue. So this is all things that are common with abortions. So if you've got somebody that's got, you know, a confirmed suspected pregnancy, they have abdominal pain and cramping, and they're bleeding, and they've had passage of tissues, it's more than likely going to end up being one of the abortions. So things for us, the orthostatic vital signs, once again, you can lie them down, you can sit them up, you can stand them up, whatever, but typically they will become hypotensive with this. And then exam for the amount of vaginal bleeding in the presence of tissue. So um, make sure that you check. Um, this is where you know it'd be very very important to you know check if there's anything in their underwear, if there's anything in the toilet, in the bed, where they first noticed it, and make sure that there's nothing that's actually expelled. Things that we need to do for them, we need to make sure we give them a high concentration of oxygen. We start one to two large bore IVs with normal saline. Put mass trousers on if indicated, if we have them. Do not pack the vagina. This is you know, common sense. I would hope everybody's well aware of this. We don't stick anything inside the vagina to try to get the bleeding to stop or the tissue being expelled to stop. Um, save any tissue that's passed. That's very important because they have to do pathology on it um, so they can find out what's going on. And then obviously transport the patient. Uh, you'd be surprised at the women that you know, do have an abortion, they've had one before, and they don't want to go to the hospital. You know, you need to make sure that you take them to the hospital, make sure that you save the tissue, talk to them, and take them to the hospital. Because if they have any kind of complications afterwards, after you leave, it's a bad thing. All right, so some medical complications. So diabetes. Um, it could be stable, it could become unstable. So someone that, you know, is a non insulin dependent diabetic, you know, and they're a stable diabetic or they're just a uh, diet controlled, they could become fairly unstable and fast with, uh, with a pregnancy. Um, gestational diabetes, obviously that's diabetes that they didn't have, they never had diabetes before, but, you know, while they are pregnant, they have diabetes, they have low blood sugar, high blood sugar, and they cannot use oral medications um, during this. So typically they just need to control with a diet. So hypertension, um, they're more susceptible to complications like uh, cerebrovascular accidents or strokes, cardiac failure, renal failure, and maybe complicated by the preeclampsia or eclampsia. And we'll get into preeclampsia and eclampsia in a little bit, the difference between those and how they kind of relate to um, hypertension. And then any kind of cardiac disorders, so additional stress placed on the heart, you know, the uh, inferior vena cava, so we know that as the baby that's why we always try to lay the moms on their left sides because if we lay them on the right sides, that means a baby could push on the inferior vena cava, which in turn is going to lower the uh, preload, and we don't want that to happen. So, additional stress placed in the heart, and then the, uh, the cardiac output increases by about 30% by uh, week 34. Right, so pregnancy induced hypertension. We got preeclampsia and eclampsia. So preeclampsia, we see it in about seven percent of the pregnancies. Um, typically, it's the twentieth week of gestation. It's the first week of postpartum. And the hypertension, um, albuminuria, and and edema. So risk factors we find, uh, first pregnancies, multiple gestations, excessive amniotic fluid, diabetes, renal, pre-existing hypertension, family history, preeclampsia, and poor nutrition. So these are all things that as we're doing our assessment of the patient, you know, things that we need to ask, you know, is this your first pregnancy? How many, you know, how many pregnancies have you had? You know, how many live births have you had? How many uh, miscarriages have you had? Any kind of excessive amniotic fluid? You know, are you a diabetic? Are you being treated for diabetes? Are you a renal patient or do you have any kind of problems with renal disease? Pre-existing hypertension, so did you, you know, did you have you been taking medication for hypertension before you became pregnant? That past history of preeclampsia for the, you know, if they got a family history of it, you're more susceptible genetically. And then, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself nutritionally, you're definitely a higher risk factor for preeclampsia. So the signs and symptoms we need to look for, 
their elevated blood pressure so it's anything over 140 um, 140 systolic or 90 diastolic or anything that's greater than 30 millimeters of mercury above the patient's normal so ask them what their normal is it's anything that's 30 millimeters of mercury above that if they have edema of their face and their hands that's you know, typically in the morning um, so it's things that we need to look for so if we get called in the morning or you can ask them you know when does your edema worse in your hands and your feet and if they tell you it's in the morning this is a sign that they may be preeclamptic all right some other things we need to look for rapid weight gain so if they gain greater than three pounds a week during their second trimester or greater than one pound a week for their third trimester and also if they have a decreased urine output so we need to ask them how much weight have you gained you know during your second trimester how much weight have you been gaining during your third trimester and just make sure that we know and so these are just things we need to make sure we note in our our run report and our PCR and then also we need to relay it to the hospital and then with the decreased urine output definitely something you need to relay so if they are complaining of a severe headache any kind of blurred vision irritability nausea and vomiting which you know most women are nausea and vomiting during their I shouldn't say most, but a lot of women um, have nausea and vomiting during their pregnancies. Epigastric pain, which is abnormal epigastric pain. And then any kind of pulmonary edema. So if they've got pulmonary edema, that's a bad thing. If they've got severe epigastric pain, blurred vision, and severe headache, these are all signs of symptoms of the preeclampsia patient. So if they got preeclampsia plus seizures or a coma, they are diagnosed with eclampsia, very eclamptic. Pregnant induced hyper, uh, hypertension. So things that we need to look for for this would be you know, the management of what we would do for uh, PIH. So in other words, the high concentration of oxygen, we need to make sure we start an IV and this is a TKO we do not give them a lot of fluids because they probably already have a fluid overload so you do not want to overload them with any more fluids put them in the left lateral recumbent position just like we talked about before take the stress off of the inferior vena cava <clears throat> the quiet environment so you need to keep it very calm not running lights and sirens and it says reduce uh, the excessive light so dim the lights in the back of the medic Put them in the left lateral recumbent position, make them comfortable, and do not run lights and sirens unless they're, you know, seizing and they are already eclamptic. Give them psychological support. Once again, avoid your lights and sirens. Um, mag sulfate, which obviously we don't give mag sulfate, but um, this is the treatment of choice for um, breaks induced hypertension. So they get four grams bolus or one gram over an hour infusion. Monitor the pulse, BP respirations, and patellar reflexes, and the calcium reverses toxicity. So if they they end up overloading the person with mag sulfate, then they can give them calcium. So assesses every patient, uh, pregnant patient for the increased blood pressure and edema, and you need to take all reported seizures in pregnant females seriously. So it's very very important that we don't overlook this and we need to ask these are questions that we need to ask okay so another complication is third trimester bleeding uh, it says 50 percent due to normal changes in the cervix about 50 due 50 percent is due to placental catastrophe so it's dangerous if the amount greater than the normal period so if it's you can ask them you know if they are using a pad you know how many pads they've went through and if it's more than a normal period it's extremely dangerous so abruptio placenta, placentae, premature placental separation from the uterus is the definition. Um, that's just a, you know, it should be a review from paramedics. About 0.4 to 3.5% of the pregnancies actually result in abruptio placentae. And risk factors, if you have an older patient, so, you know, females that are, you know, late 30s, early 40s um, and older, hypertensive patients, uh, multigravitis so in other words you've got a patient that you know had multiple pregnancies multiple children and any kind of trauma 
So a mild to moderate vaginal bleeding. Um, it's continuous knife-like abdominal pain. So third trimester abort. So it's, a, it's abruption until proven otherwise. Anybody that's had, and I've only had one patient with abruptio, um, and it was exactly what they described it as. They said it felt like a knife. It was sticking them in the abdomen. They have a very rigid, tender uterus. They will have signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, and it's out of proportion to the visible bleeding. So, basically, it's, you know, even though they have, you know, a decent amount of blood, their blood pressure and their will be crappy. They're, they'll be very uh, tachycardic. They could have a decrease in level of consciousness, all being indicative of hypovolemia. And then it says alteration of the contraction pattern. So we'll set the previa. It's a placental implantation over the cervical over the cervical opening. Happens in about um, half percent of the pregnancies. Some of the predisposing factors: so increasing age, body parity, uh, previous cesarean sections, and then it says it can lead to placental insufficiency and then fetal hypoxia. So very bad. Painless, bright red vaginal bleeding. So dark red. You know. A lot of times that is the abruptio, bright red, that's the placenta previa. Soft, non-tender uterus, typically don't have contractions with it, but they do have signs and symptoms of hypovolemia. So you can see that you know, essentially that's the, this is the placenta. So if the placenta is there before the baby is expelled, you know, I think, every, I would hope everybody knows that we want the baby to come out first, then the placenta, so if the placenta is, you know, it's a placenta previa or, you know, before the baby. That is a bad thing. So for third trimester bleeding, we need to make sure we give them 100% oxygen. So that's with an honor breather mask, you know, 12 to 15 liters per minute. Just to start two large bore IVs. Keep them in the left, left lateral recovery position. Mass only with the legs only. So you're only inflating the legs if they put mass back into the protocol and then assessing for fetal heart tones you know, obviously we don't have uh, dopplers but if at some point we do have we do get dopplers we want to try to assess for fetal heart tones if you can it's very hard to hear fetal heart tones um, anybody that ever did their rotations you know I'll, I would hope everybody did rotations for paramedics but when you do them and if they let you listen to fetal heart tones they're to me they're very hard to hear Wow, that is a very large baby, but that is a uh, that looks like a diabetes baby, um, you know, where a mom had diabetes or gestational diabetes. Very large child. All right, it says never perform vaginal exam on a third trimester patient with vaginal bleeding. So you need to be very very careful with this. Um, you don't want to, you know. No glove fingers, anything like that. There's nothing wrong with looking to make sure that there's nothing being expelled, but you never want to put a glove finger or anything in um, because you could end up rupturing something. All right, so this is hyperemesis uh, gravidarium, so severe nausea and vomiting. My wife suffered from this, unfortunately. Uh, this was from day one, you know, from the time she found out she's pregnant until, you know, literally until we had our son. So it was nonstop vomiting. So it leads to starvation, dehydration, and acidosis, and it continued vomiting in pregnancy with a loss of weight. And it was there was nothing she could do to make it stop. It was just constant. She had to work through it. So replacing lost fluids and electrolytes. This is the Gatorades and such things like that, um, and other things that you know maybe starting IVs on them. Sometimes. You'd have to start an IV to get an electrolyte replacement. And then glucose. So making sure that they eat something that contains stored sugars um, so they aren't you know, depleting their body of glucose and depleting the child of glucose. So spine hypotensive syndrome. Um, that's the uterus that compresses in fear of vena cava. We talked about this. Um, so if you lie them flat or you try to lie them on the right side, the uterus ends up compressing the inferior vena cava, which in turn is going to decrease the amount of blood that's returning to the, to the body or to the heart. Um, it's a bad thing. Once you have a decreased venous return, it leads to decreased cardiac output. And then if they're decreased at cardiac output, their BP decreases. And then 
that was it says to consider the volume depletion. So once you start depleting that, that's going to starve the child of oxygen, starve the child of any kind of nutrients. The mom is going to obviously start shunning blood, and they're going to take it to the vital organs. They need that return. So that's why we make sure that we always put them in the left lateral common position so it takes the stress off of that inferior vena cava. So we place the patient on the left side, make sure we restore any kind of venous return, we transport all of our non-laboring patients to late pregnancy on the left side. So this is something we've been doing for years. It's just a reminder. All right, so ruptured membranes. So vaginal leakage of a clear colorless fluid. About 84% of the labor spontaneously in 24 hours. So, but 50% become infected in 12 hours. So you have to be very, very aware that you know once the membranes have ruptured, they start to dry out, and then everything starts to become infected. So it takes about 12 hours. So the longer the mom waits, um, the worse it could be for them. So it says increased time equals increased infection rate or infection risk. So once the baby is, or I'm sorry, once you know, the membranes have ruptured, one, if the mom waits too long, or two, if it's a delivery that's going to take a long time, they have an increased infection risk. And it says a patient must come to the hospital. So fever, dysuria, so like a urinary tract infection, so it is a major medical emergency. And it's a major medical emergency for the mom and the baby both. All right, so this suggests urinary tract or amniotic fluid infection. Sepsis or early labor may result, and the patient must come to the hospital. All right, so if the mom is complaining of having a fever or she's got a burning sensation when she is urinating, these are things that should obviously key us off, or she's got an abnormal odor. Things should key us off that, you know, she may have dysuria or she's got some kind of urinary tract infection or amniotic fluid infection. Excuse me, and once again, it is a major medical emergency. All right, so the uterine rupture. So common causes would be a prolonged labor uh, against the obstruction, any kind of large fetus, old C-section, and then multiple pregnancies. So once again, if you know the mom is in labor for a long time against the obstruction, if the baby is larger than the mom, large baby, small uh, cervix, if they had an old C-section, or you know this is you know their fifth or sixth kid. So have a potential for a uterine rupture. So a sudden intense tearing abdominal pain. It's a big sign of uterine rupture. They have signs of sense of hypovolemic shock, loss of continuity of the uterine mass, and the possible vaginal bleeding. The big one would be the sudden intense tearing abdominal pain. So about 50 to 75% fetal mortality. This is a very dangerous for the child. So we want to make sure we give them same thing, IV O2 monitor, give them two large bore IVs, left lateral recovery position, transport. So that's the you know that's going to be the treatment of the day for just about any kind of pregnancy is left lateral recumbent, 100% oxygen, a couple of IVs, and get them to the hospital. All right. So trauma in the pregnancy, we're looking for minor trauma. Um, Things that are common is the obstetric patient. So syncopal episodes, that's very common in the obstetric patient. Um, diminished coordination, so they're kind of you know top heavy, so to speak, and they lose their balance and they fall and they hit their belly on you know a step or a chair or on the side of a table, and they have loosening of the joints because their body is starting to. Um, release hormones that's going to soften their cervix and that means it softens other things so their joints start to get looser and they have a hard time walking. So major trauma in pregnancy so this is susceptible to a life-threatening episode increased vascular, vascularity and it may deteriorate suddenly so these patients they can just like a pediatric patient that's got respiratory problems they can crash fairly easy trauma prey trauma patients that are pregnant um, there's no doubt they will deteriorate very very rapidly so you need to make sure that you treat them appropriately get them in the back of the ambulance get them to the hospital in a reasonable amount of time so it's a leading cause of maternal death in pregnancy and about 
and motor vehicle collisions account for 50% of the perinatal mortality. So, the trauma can be from a premature separation of placenta, so just basically a shearing effect. Premature labor, it puts the female into labor. A spontaneous abortion, the rupture of the uterus, and then fetal death. So, if the fetal death, so that could be, if the baby dies, that could be because the mother died. Um, separation of the placenta, the mom going into shock, and she's basically using the, she's shunting all the blood for herself, and robbing the, the fetus of any kind of nutrients or any kind of blood supply, uterine rupture, and then the fetal head injury. So an injured woman of childbearing age, consider pregnancy. Priority is exactly the same as any other patient. And always make sure you do your airway breathing circulation first. These are important for this patient. So don't just get yourself focused on the pregnancy. You need to make sure that you take care of the mom because if you can't take care of mom, then in turn, she's not going to be able to help the baby. So the vital signs, this is it mimics hypovolemia. Uh, pulse will increase about 10 to 15 times a minute and beats per minute and your BP will decrease. So the blood volume increases up to about 45%. Um, more blood loss can occur before the signs of symptoms of hypovolemia appear. So it could be a late sign, especially if you're looking for like a lowering of blood pressure. Tachycardia or that change of mental status can be some of the first things you're going to see in a hypovolemic patient and that's in shock versus the BP. So you can't rely on just the blood pressure alone. It says in hypovolemia, blood is shunted from the placenta, causing the fetal distress. So once again, the, the mom is going to try to use the blood loss that she's, the, what blood she has remaining to keep herself alive. And it's going to end up robbing the baby of uh, any kind of nutrients that it needs. So an increased fluid volume needed to treat the hypovolemia. Penetrating abdominal trauma is second, third trimester frequently involves the uterus. And the greatest danger from uterine injury is hypovolemia. We need to treat this aggressively. Uh, it says the fetus may be distressed and the mother is not. Signs and symptoms of shock may appear late and more volume needed to correct the hypovolemia. Because their blood volume is increased, it's going to take more volume to correct the hypovolemia. And with the fetus being uh, distressed, so you can't always rely on the mother um, for saying that the fetus can be distressed. You need to basically treat the shock aggressively and make sure that you get the patient to the hospital And any time that you have a trauma patient that's pregnant. Okay, this is oxygenated aggressively. This includes, you know, this is non breathers with 15 liters, 12 to 15 liters per minute. If you have to bag the patient because she's not ventilating properly. So it's considered assisting the ventilation early. So oxygen demand increased about 10 to 20% the last trimester. And the high diaphragm causes a decreased compliance and a tidal volume. So because their fundus is up so high, it's pushing up on their lungs. And they're going to have a hard time trying to um, get a good tidal volume out of their lungs. So you need to make sure that you may have to assist their ventilations. Because their oxygen saturations and ventilatory effort may be decreased. This mask can be used in a late-term pregnancy, inflate the legs only, and using the abdominal compartment reduces the blood flow to the fetus. So we don't want to use the abdominal compartment. Once again, this is only if the mass trousers ever come back into our protocol. So after the first trimester, never transport the patient flat on their back. Always transport on their left side. You want to prop up on the right side of the spine board with a blanket and pillows. This is something that we do really well. Um, it's just uh, basically it's a good reminder that if you have to prop the patient up, make sure that you know the right side of the spine board basically underneath of it if we have a backboarded. So the fetus and the uterus is all laying off to the left and it's taking the pressure off of the inferior vena cava. So it's the most common cause of fetal death from trauma is the maternal death. Um, keeping the mom alive keeps the baby alive and what's good for the mom is good for the baby. So what you may think is, you know, a dead mom, you may have to do CPR on that patient. Doing CPR is, you know, keeping the blood flowing, and that may keep the baby alive until they can get to the hospital and they can do emergency cesarean section. 
So Braxton Hicks contractions or false contractions usually occurs in the third trimester. So it's a benign phenomenon that stimulates uh, stimulates labor, and the contractions are generally painless, and a walking may help. So this is basically they think that they're having contractions or Braxton Hicks contractions, and they're not true labor contractions. So preterm labor, um, this is labor that begins prior to 38 weeks of gestation. So labor is the results of progressive dilation and effacement of the cervix. So some of the causes of preterm labor, multiple gestations. So if the mom has been pregnant multiple times, whether it's, you know, if she's had a abortion or not, you know, any kind of spontaneous abortions or she's had any kind of other complications, just multiple gestations in general, uh, intrauterine infections, premature rupture of the membranes, and then the uterine or cervical ab uh, anatomical abnormalities. So if they've got some kind of a, you know, a smaller cervix or they've got a uterine problem, um, they could definitely put them into preterm labor. Obviously, that is a, a very, very, very small child in a preterm. You can see that they're innovating in that lower, the lower side here. Um, doesn't take much. Very small tube. It looks like that's you know probably a a one. You know, it's a one and a half. It's a very, very tiny tube. So management, um, consider for uh, consideration of uh, cystokinesis. So rest, fluids, and sedation. So we're gonna they need to make sure that they rest. They need to make sure they get fluids, and then they need to be, you know, basically they need to be knocked out, or they need to be, have complete rest so their body can heal on its own. And then you need to transport them for evaluation. That's definitely something that we need to make sure we take them to the hospital. I mean, there's not too many pregnancy related problems that we should not be taking the patient to the hospital. Alright, so that is the end of this lecture. You will watch the next three lectures and then you will take the quiz on Quizstar. Thank you.